I do believe people can change the way they think about money and the way they think about how they manage their money. We have no long-term financial plan. <laughs> Managing money is not always easy and it's not always fun, but it is the only way to make your financial dreams come true. So are you managing your money or is your money managing you? We'll help you figure it out on this edition of Money Wise. You wouldn't go on a road trip without a road map, otherwise you might never reach your destination. But too many of us are going through life without another kind of road map, a financial road map. And without proper planning, we might never reach our financial goals. On this episode of Money Wise, we'll share some basic concepts for managing your money. They're all designed to help you plan a profitable journey through life. But first, let's meet our Money Wise experts. Jesse Brown is president of his own investment advisory firm and author of a book entitled Pay Yourself First. Beth Copeliner is a freelance financial writer for the New York Times and author of Get a Financial Life. And Shannon Ryan is a certified financial planner with American Express Financial Advisors. I'm happy all of you could be here. I want each one of you to tell us quickly, what is your favorite saying about managing money? Shannon? Mine is from Proverbs. Uh, in labor, there is profit, but in mere words, there is poverty. And the reason why I like the saying is because as a financial advisor, I hear a lot of mere words, but people do not labor to find financial success. Beth? Mine's less literary. It's just do it. Famous mm -hmm. saying from Nike. Um, I think people get overwhelmed by their choices. There's so many mutual funds out there. What are IRAs? What sort of tax strategy should they use? The bottom line is get out of debt, start to save, and begin to invest. It's easier than you think. Jesse? You know, Calvin, I'm reminded of the famous uh, civil rights stalwart Hattie Lou Hamer when she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Well, quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of being broke and hearing people mm -hmm. talk about being broke. And so I encourage people to pay themselves first. Some good food for thought. Well, you never know what goes on behind closed doors, but we do, at least when it comes to managing money. Our Money Wise cover story is next. Knowledge TV Retro, brought to you by Jones International University, the first fully online accredited university. Change your life for the better on your schedule. Eight-week classes begin next month. Visit JIU.edu to find out more. I see other people with nice cars and of course I'd want that, but when I actually have to go and write that check, then I realize, you know what, there's maybe something I'd like in 10 years that's going to have a lot more long-term value to me than having a convertible. Every family has its own way of managing money. Some have it down to a science, others are barely managing at all. Chances are you'll see yourself in one of these families you're about to meet. Paying the bills, dealing with debt, saving and investing, making it all balance out. The job of managing your personal finances can be daunting, especially if you've developed some expensive habits. If I like it, I'll just buy it. You know, I'll spend whatever it costs to buy it if I like it. Come here. Here. Who's that? Kim Johnson Ball is a bankruptcy lawyer with two children. She says her husband, Kenneth, is the frugal one in the family. I am a spendthrift. Um, I've always liked spending money. I still like spending money. <laughs> Their household income is close to $100,000 a year. But with a brand new luxury townhouse and student loan payments for Kim's law school, money is always tight. I'm guessing that we're probably in a negative cash flow at the end of the month because I find myself having to juggle bills, um, make some minimum payments, which is something that I don't ideally like to do. Kim's family has nearly $2,000 in credit card debt and no personal savings. Sometimes I sit down and I go through exactly what I'm paying out on a monthly basis. Um, and it's such a bleak picture that... <laughs> 
that I, I guess it, it deters me from wanting to do it on a long-term basis. I see. But personal finance experts would say that's exactly what the family needs to get ahead, a long-term financial plan, including strategies for savings, investments, retirement, debt management, an emergency or rainy day fund, and adequate insurance coverage. But making a financial roadmap isn't always easy. Sometimes it takes a little outside help. Jeff and Mary Jane Woodbridge wanted to develop a strategy for managing their money, but couldn't seem to actually do it. Then they met with Shannon Ryan, a financial planner. Hi, Shannon. Hey, Jeff. Jeff Woodbridge. Nice, nice to meet you. Meet you. I'm Mary Hi, Jane. Shannon. How are you? Nice Ryan. I think it's going to, like I said, give us the push or the kick. The to, kick. The kick to get us started. And I'm very, I'm very excited about the opportunity that she presented to us. This is your financial analysis. You're going to find it has several different areas. The first Shannon tells the Woodbridges their finances are actually in pretty good shape. Jeff and Mary Jane have built up nearly $50,000 in savings, but have told Shannon they want to buy a house and start a family, and that Mary Jane wants to stay at home with the kids. I'm going to initially recommend that you earmark $12,000 of your $24,000 in cash or cash reserves. Shannon suggests dividing up their savings for each financial goal and reinvesting the money at a better interest rate. Are you comfortable with those recommendations? Yeah, I think we need to do something with the money that's sitting there. Yeah. And the strategy that she laid out for us, I think, is I think it's pretty sound. I think we'll listen to what she what she told us to do and try to invest that money. How about if I play chicken with you in October? <laughs> Some people need a little push to make a financial plan. Others actually enjoy managing money. What was it before? 13? Been as high as 18. To Tina Slater and her husband Don, managing money is a little like a game, and cutting costs is the object. This is where we keep uh, track of our cash expenditures. This is groceries. The Slaters live on a strict budget and keep track of where their money is going down to the last dollar and cent. Vet, $9. Food. Container store credit. $15.74. Well, if we can keep up with it every week or every 10 days, we say, oh, well, we're not going to spend money here or spend money there because we're getting too low. By watching every penny, the Slaters do something that sounds downright un American in today's consumer society. They live beneath their means. For starters, they live in a smaller and more modest home than they can actually afford. Each of their cars is more than 10 years old, and every purchase, large and small, is carefully planned. Um, we ordered 15 bushes to put in the backyard as kind of a, uh, of a screen. Even the bushes are an investment in the house. Let me see, investments, portfolio view. Yeah, portfolio view. Through planning and a little bit of discipline, Don and Tina are able to save $2,500 a month, and what they save, they invest. I do believe people can change the way they think about money and the way they think about how they manage their money. I certainly have changed the way that I deal with money, the way I look at it, Tina has changed too. Kim Johnson Ball is trying to change the way she manages money. She and her husband have started savings accounts for the children, and she stopped using her credit cards most of the time. Will she take the next step and make a real financial plan? I know that that's something that I need to do. I need to be more practical. Um, I need to have a, a better understanding of finances, I think. And what I'd like to do, ideally, is to teach my children not to be the spendthrift that I am. And Shannon, since you're the star of our cover story, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Uh, first, what are the basics of a good financial plan? The first step in a good financial plan is creating a good, solid financial foundation. And that really consists of two areas. First of all, having an adequate cash reserve. And second of all, protection planning. What I mean here is making sure that if there's a disability or premature death that the family is taken care of. Once that's established, then you take a look at reaching goals such as retirement or education of children. How do you know when you need professional help? 
When you need professional help is when you won't do it on your own. I believe that people can do financial planning on their own. However, they very rarely do. Procrastination is the biggest disease we see in financial areas. Now, <clears throat> you know, what do people need to do before they come to see you or any other financial planner? In most cases, a financial advisor is going to want several things. They're going to want to have an understanding, first and foremost, of the goals that you have for yourself. They're going to want to see your current budget. Usually the last three tax years of tax returns, they're going to want to know any types of investments you've made either individually and personally or through your employer as well as your employer benefits. Let's, let's go through the families that we met on our, on mm -hmm. our uh, tape. Mm -hmm. Jeff and Mary Jane, are they typical? I wouldn't call them typical. They've done a wonderful job in savings. Where they are typical is they have not gotten help yet, meaning they had a, a very large amount of money sitting in cash and not working very hard for them. How about Ken and Kenneth? They are very typical. They are living on credit cards. They're shuffling paycheck to paycheck. Um, this is probably the most typical couple that you had on today. <laughs> and Don and Tina? You know, Don and Tina are doing an extraordinary job of living beneath their means and are saving at a level where you see very few people in this country save. Mm -hmm. Now, is it, is it uh, typical though, to see so many people save as much money as they're saving on a regular basis? Absolutely not. $2,500 a month in many cases is how much many families in this country are living on per month. But I think the most important lesson to be learned here is living beneath your means simply means that you don't live in the maximum house you can afford or drive the nicest cars you possibly can on your budget, but live within your means and save a little bit every single month to reach your financial goals. Beth, anything strike you about our video? I think the debt issue is just something that's plaguing our nation, and I think a lot of these families are showing this is a real problem for them. Credit card companies last year shipped out 2 billion credit card solicitations, which is on average 12 credit cards for every man, woman, and child in the United States. That means people are deep in debt, they're having major trouble, and bankruptcies are at record highs. So I think reining in that credit card debt is the number one issue people have to face. Jesse, what do you think of the tape? Well, I think it was extraordinary in terms of the saving and investment habits of it, at least two of the uh, individuals. The middle couple, though, I think is quite typical. Uh, unfortunately, more people um, do rely upon living paycheck to paycheck, and that's why I insist upon that they add one more bill to their, uh, to their, to their list of bills. And as you know, I think they should pay themselves first. Well, what's the most important bill you have to pay every month? The mortgage, the car payment, credit cards? The answer is none of those. We'll explain when we come back. What we do is we take our savings portion out of our income first before we pay any other bills, before we uh, do any other uh, discretionary spending. We put our savings aside first. Well, we've covered some of the basics on how to make a financial roadmap, but putting a plan into action, now that's a different story. All three of our MoneyWise experts are here to share some thoughts on how you can get started. Beth, uh, first, how do you get in the mindset to start saving? I think for a lot of people it's really difficult, and I think one way you can do it, as we've been talking about, by paying yourself first, there's technology in place now where you can tell a bank, take out $50, $100, whatever, out of my paycheck every single month and funnel into a mutual fund for me. For me. By setting up some concrete, automatic savings plans, you really will be well on your way to getting started. Now, Jesse, you wrote the book, Pay Yourself First. I'll give you a chance to define exactly what you mean. Well. Frankly, when you think about it, what is your most important bill? Most people tend to say it's their mortgage or their car note or whatever, but you know, you can always go home and stay with mama. <laughs> you know, the most important thing is to have money in your own pocket. I often say the worst thing that could possibly happen to you is that you're old, sick, and broke. You have to have money in your pocket. My best salesman is Uncle Sam. Social Security is in its own set of jeopardy we are going to have to take care of ourselves now more than ever before the government entitlement programs aren't going to be there for us so I say pay yourself first. Shannon mm -hmm. uh, you commented about living beneath your means mm -hmm. why is that so important? It's important because I firmly believe that regardless of the income that you currently receive that you have the ability to have financial independence and dignity in your life and that means simply taking a look at what you're bringing home every month 
spend less. Live within your means to achieve financial success. Uh, now, Jesse, have you been having any success helping your clients live beneath their means? Well, it's been very difficult. You see, we live in a society where conspicuous consumption is the order of the day. And we want to keep up with the Joneses and look good and smell good and, you know, vacation at all the right places. But I often tell people that, you know, this gravy train is going to end, and when it ends, where are you going to be? That's why I insist that people look at all their bills, make themselves right there up there with tithing and and all the other important things in their life and to put themselves on the list. Now, now Beth, when do people know it's time for them to start really saving and investing? You, to get real serious, when's, when's a good time? Unfortunately, there's no magic gong that goes off. There's really nobody there to tell you now it's time to start. What you want to do is first set up an emergency savings cushion of about three to six months worth of living expenses. Put that in a money market fund, a super safe investment that will pay you more than a bank account, and then you're ready to start investing, looking into stock mutual funds, bond mutual funds. That's the steps you need to take, starting getting out of debt, starting that money market fund, and then beginning to invest. I'd like each one of you to, to help us understand why retirement is all of a sudden a very, very important goal for most Americans. Shannon? I think the most important driver behind retirement issues today is we have moved from a society that has has dependence on defined benefits to defined contributions. It has now been put in our court to save for our retirement and this is causing a lot of people to fall short. Less than 10 percent of America can retire in what I would call a style that has some dignity to it. Jesse? Well I think most Americans have just about now figured out why the government selected 62 or 65 for the time for them to get their Social Security checks. You know, back in the 1930s, the government went to an actuarial table, found out most people would die at age 60, so they figured 65 was a good time to give you your money. <laughs> Unfortunately, because of medical science, we're living longer now than ever before. So if people are thinking that they're going to retire at 65 and have enough money to, uh, to live on, they're quickly finding out that they're living to 80 and 90 years old. So my prayer is that I outlive my money, and the only way I'm going to be able to do that is by saving and investing now. Beth? I'd say one of the most important things you can do if you take anything away from the whole world of financial planning is start saving in a company 401k plan at work. And if you don't have one at work, open an individual retirement account or IRA. These are the best tax-deferred or even tax-free plans you can get. They allow your money to compound exponentially, and they're really the best deals around. So people need to know they have to take advantage of retirement plans. Ooh, some good thoughts. Ever heard of a no-budget budget? Our Money Wise exercise is next. Knowledge TV Retro, brought to you by Jones International University, the first fully online accredited university. Change your life for the better on your schedule. Eight-week classes begin next month. Visit JIU.edu to find out more. We do not live on a budget. Our family <laughs> does not live on a budget. Um, we spend and buy as we need. There's no set amount for any one thing. Um, at any given time, on any given month, on any given day. What she just said is true of a lot of families. So we want to suggest some ways for putting a little discipline into your financial life, whether you're on a budget or not. In our first Money Wise exercise, we're going to look at opportunities for holding on to money and making it work for you. Here are just a few ideas. Bonuses and raises can be saved instead of being spent. So can income tax refunds. And no matter how well you're doing, you can always clip coupons and take advantage of discounts and put away the money you save for the future. Shannon, do you have any other suggestions? What I would add to that list is when you make a commitment to yourself on how much you can save on a monthly basis, also make the commitment that every six months you're going to review that and increase it. Even if it's by $5, increase it and continue to do that year after year. And now for exercise number two. Some people just can't live on a budget, but there's no, there is such a thing as a no budget budget. That means recording your expenses for one month and looking for places to cut. You can buy a used car instead of a new one, cut entertainment expenses, and stop subscribing to so many magazines. Jesse, what would you add? 
Well, I think they ought to subscribe to MoneyWise magazine. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but in addition to that, you know, there are so many things that we have uh, got accustomed to in life that, you know, we didn't have in years past. Say, take, for instance, the cellular telephone. Now, cellular telephones are nice and they're safe, but do you need four and five? And do you have to order the pizza and go to the pizza parlor and stand outside and say, is it ready yet? <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we can walk inside and not use a cellular phone so often. Good point. For exercise number three, let's brainstorm some financial goals that people can set for themselves. Number, the, number one, of course, is starting an emergency fund. Starting to build up some savings for future financial goals is another solid idea. And of course, getting out of debt. Beth, what would you add? I would add to that list a real concrete goal of coming up with a down payment for a home. The number one ob obstacle for first-time home buyers is coming up with that ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars you need to get into that house. So I'd say set that goal, figure out how much you're going to need for a down payment, and then figure out how much you need to save each month to meet that goal. That's all the time we have for today. I want to thank all three of our guests. And here are some other places that you can turn to for help with managing your money. You can call Jesse Brown at Crystal Investment Management at 1-800-541-9578. And he also provides plenty of free information on the web. And for locating a certified financial planner in your area, you can call the Institute of Certified Financial Planners at 1-800-282-7526. And there are several companies that offer free financial seminars around the country. They include American Express Financial Advisors, Charles Schwab and Company, and Merrill Lynch. Check your local listings for these numbers. Thank you for joining us, and until next time, I'm Calvin Boston, and remember that the best way to protect your financial future is to become Money Wise. Knowledge TV Retro, brought to you by Jones International University, the first fully online accredited university. Change your life for the better on your schedule. Eight-week classes begin next month. Visit JIU.edu to find out more. I see other people with nice cars, and of course I'd want that, but when I actually have to go and write that check, then I realize, you know what, there's maybe something I'd like in 10 years that's going to have a lot more long-term value to me than having a convertible. Every family has its own way of managing money. Some have it down to a science, others are barely managing at all. Chances are you'll see yourself in one of these families you're about to meet. I do believe people can change the way they think about money and the way they think about how they manage their money. We have no long-term financial plan. <laughs> Managing money is not always easy and it's not always fun, but it is the only way to make your financial dreams come true. So are you managing your money or is your money managing you? We'll help you figure it out on this edition of Money Wise. You wouldn't go on a road trip without a road map, otherwise you might never reach your destination. 
but too many of us. There is poverty. And the reason why I like the saying is because as a financial advisor, I hear a lot of mere words, but people do not labor to find financial success. Beth? Mine's less literary. It's just do it. Famous mm -hmm. saying from Nike. Um, I think people get overwhelmed by their choices. There's so many mutual funds out there. What are IRAs? What sort of tax strategy should they use? The bottom line is get out of debt, start to save, and begin to invest. It's easier than you think. Jesse? You know, Calvin, I'm reminded of the famous uh, civil rights stalwart Hattie Lou Hamer when she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Well, quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of being broke and hearing people mm -hmm. talk about being broke. And so I encourage people to pay themselves first. Some good food for thought. Well, you never know what goes on behind closed doors, but we do, at least when it comes to managing money. Our Money Wise cover story is are going through life without another kind of roadmap, a financial roadmap. And without proper planning, we might never reach our financial goals. On this episode of Money Wise, we'll share some basic concepts for managing your money. They're all designed to help you plan a profitable journey through life. But first, let's meet our Money Wise experts. Jesse Brown is president of his own investment advisory firm and author of a book entitled Pay Yourself First. Beth Copeliner is a freelance financial writer for the New York Times and author of Get a Financial Life. And Shannon Ryan is a certified financial planner with American Express Financial Advisors. I'm happy all of you could be here. I want each one of you to tell us quickly, what is your favorite saying about managing money? Shen? Mine is from Proverbs. Uh, in labor, there is profit, but in mere words. Paying the bills, dealing with debt, saving and investing, making it all balance out. The job of managing your personal finances can be daunting, especially if you've developed some expensive habits. If I like it, I'll just buy it. You know, I'll spend whatever it costs to buy it if I like it. Come here. Here. Who's that? Kim Johnson Ball is a bankruptcy lawyer with two children. She says her husband, Kenneth, is the frugal one in the family. I am a spendthrift. Um, I've always liked spending money. I still like spending money. <laughs> Their household income is close to $100,000 a year. But with a brand new luxury townhouse and student loan payments for Kim's law school, money is always tight. I'm guessing that we're probably in a negative cash.